So last week we had our all-age service and we were talking about biblical boasting. We were going from these words in 2 Corinthians 12 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. So when I am weak, then I am strong. And I want to keep exploring these words a little bit, uh, exploring, well, first, yeah, let me just, yeah, I want to keep exploring these a little bit, because naturally, we like to share about our strengths, our successes, those things that have gone well, uh, but Paul says he will boast more gladly about his weaknesses, and I want to explore what those, what that might mean, what it might look like, what it's kind of about. And um, the reason he says he'll boast more about his weaknesses about is because he knows that when he does that, Christ's power may rest on him. And um, I shared with you last week about how um, when we do all the things we do super well, we don't really need God's help at all. It's only in our weaknesses that God can actually do anything with us of value, really. Which got me thinking about value and why the world values certain things as it does. I showed you a car and works of art that were worth hundreds of millions of pounds and dollars. And we said the reason that they are worth so much is because of their rarity. If it's a one-of-a-kind thing, it adds huge value to it. And um, one of the realizations I had the other week was that the more broken I am, the more unique I become. And therefore, the more valuable I am to the kingdom of God. And so I wrote this in my journal. Thank you, Father, that in my brokenness I am becoming more unique. Because we talked about kintsugi, uh, the Japanese art of putting broken pottery back together with gold. And the more broken a pot is, the more gold it has in it. And in reality, the more that we go through life and the more we experience it, the more we allow Jesus in, then the more of his love fills us. So the more like him we are. And I came to see that every time I felt broken, every time I felt like there'd been a chip taken off me, if I allowed Jesus to heal me and to pour his love into that crack or that break, then I became even more valuable. Not to him, of course, because I can't be more valuable to him. But actually to the world, to the earth, somehow you become even more valuable because I came to see again that brokenness and weakness is where Jesus loves to live. And as that we keep giving our brokenness to him and allowing him to heal us, we become more and more valuable to one another because we carry more and more of his love. So I want to keep sharing this thought with you today and show you how this theme runs through the Bible like a stick of rock. And I know it's something we know, but I felt like I wanted to remind you of it. This theme of power in weakness is so central to the biblical idea, but of course so alien to our culture. But I cannot get away from the truth that real power only comes through what the world calls weakness. It's the only way it comes. And one of the key ways that's shown is in Psalm 8. And I want to show you a video from the Bible project that outlines it really well. And I just want you to see and be reminded of just how much the Bible declares that weakness is strength and that weakness is power. You're right to play that, Simon? O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. These are the opening words from Psalm 8 in the Bible. It's a beautiful poem about how the creator God rules the world through babbling babies. Huh? Babbling babies? Yeah, this is really cool. Let's dive in. Okay, first let's get our bearings. In the collection of literature called the Hebrew Bible, there's a large scroll of poetry called the Psalms. There are 150 poems in the Psalm scroll that have been organized into five sub-collections, sometimes called books. And we're going to be in book one of the Psalms. Right. Now, book one is designed like this. There's a two-poem introduction, followed by four more groups of Psalms. Now, first, let's look at the two-part introduction. It's important because it introduces a key idea for the whole collection of Psalms. It's about God's promise to deal with evil and violence in the world by raising up an anointed king for Israel. So who is this king? 
Well, the Hebrew word for anointed is Mashiach, or Messiah. This refers back to a promise that God made to David, the king of Israel. God said that a future Messiah would come from his line, and Psalm 2 says that this powerful king will confront violent world rulers, and he'll become a protective fortress for any who take refuge in him. After the two-part introduction is the next group of Psalms, 3 through 14, and our Psalm, Psalm 8, is right in the middle. And the fact that it's in the center is important. Let me show you why. First, in Psalms 3 through 7, we're invited to reflect on David's story from the past, when he was powerless and had to hide from his enemies. In these poems, David cries out to God to deliver him and restore him to his role as king. Then after Psalm 8 comes Psalms 9 to 14. David is joined by a group of people called the poor and afflicted ones. Like David, they're oppressed by powerful rulers, and they too cry out to God, asking him to confront these world empires and vindicate his people. Both David and the afflicted ones are really powerless and weak. And yet, they are the ones that God has chosen to rule the world. And this is what Psalm 8 in the center is all about. It begins by saying, Yahweh our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the land. You have set your splendor above the skies. So Yahweh is the king of creation, and you can see his royal power on display everywhere. Now that first line is repeated again at the end of Psalm 8. Right, that's called an inclusio. It's a signal to the reader of what the poem is all about, God's majestic power that fills all creation. But David and the afflicted ones aren't experiencing God's power at the moment. Right, this is what the rest of the poem is all about. There are two parallel sections. And in the first, we're introduced to a weak little creature, a bunch of babbling babies. From the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have established a stronghold because of your adversaries to stop the enemy and the avenger. Now, the Hebrew word for stronghold is oz, which can mean strength or also a strong place, like a fortress or a refuge. God's gonna build a fortress out of baby babel to stop violent enemies? Yeah. It's like a riddle that is going to be unpacked by the next matching part of the poem. When I consider your skies, the moon and the stars which you have established, what is human that you remember him, and the son of humanity that you attend to him? So the poet's here reflecting on the creation narrative of Genesis chapter 1, where there's contrast. God installs the heavenly lights above in all their splendor, and then below he forms the humans out of dirt. Yeah, I get this, looking up at the night sky, feeling so small and insignificant. Why are humans so important to God? And so the poet continues. You made humanity a little lesser than spiritual beings, yet you crown them with glory and majesty. In Genesis, God elevates the weak little dirt creatures for this majestic task to be his image who will rule over all creation. The poet can hardly believe it. You made them rulers over the work of your hands. You put everything under their feet. So both parts of this poem are about how God loves to elevate the powerless so he can rule the world through them. Whether babbling babies or lowly humans, God loves to choose the weak. Yes, just like David and like the poor and afflicted ones. And altogether, they set the pattern for that ultimate human, the Messiah of <coughs> Psalms 1 and 2. And he will rule over all the land. Now, these ideas in Psalm 8 lead us forward to the story of Jesus. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, Jesus rides into Jerusalem as a king to confront Israel's powerful leaders. But he's on a donkey, not a war horse. And the people hailing him as their king are the poor and children. So Israel's leaders mock Jesus and then have him executed. But then God raised Jesus from the dead and exalted him as the cosmic king, the true image of God. Then Jesus invited his followers to share in his power and mission, but it's a different kind of power. Yeah, it's like how Jesus said that to be his follower is to become like a child. Yes, when God's people serve others from a place of humility and powerlessness, that's when God's kingdom and power are most on display. O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the land. Thanks, Sam. Okay, a couple of... I just want to give you like a big macro picture before we... Come on. 
drill down. <clears throat> God loves to elevate the powerless so he can rule the world through them. Whether babbling babies or lowly humans, God loves to choose the weak. When God's people serve others from a place of humility and powerlessness, that's when God's kingdom and power are most on display. So, what might it mean then to be in that place of weakness and powerlessness, to boast all the more gladly about our weaknesses, as Paul said? Well, firstly, maybe it looks like balance in our speech and our sharing. What it doesn't mean is that we spend all our time telling anyone and everyone how tough life is, how hard it is, and how challenging it is. I've sat through groups like that at times, and it just makes you want to give up. It's awful. I've also at times sat through what I call smiley happy Christian meetings, where everything's wonderful and nobody has any issues. Not that might want to give up, it makes me want to throw up. Um, neither are particularly fun, I don't know about you, but I'm like, just get... Ugh. Anyways. And I react in that way because... I don't find much reality in that. No sense of vulnerability, of honesty. And once you've experienced life and relationships that are built on reality and honesty and vulnerability, you are spoiled for them. And sadly, anything else feels a little shallow and disappointing. But these two scenarios are the extremes. And for me, it's all about balance. So, so yes, there's over here where, woo, everything's wonderful, Jesus loves me, and that makes it all all right. Well, it does, but also it doesn't. Um, and then you've got this other extreme where I'm just going to tell you how terrible life is. Well, it is, but you also live in the Western world. So actually, you're all right. right? Let's just bring some reality to it as well. But I guess my question is, can we find ourselves in a place where we are utterly honest and real about the challenges of life, but where we can at the same time acknowledge the incredible goodness of God and his presence and working in our lives? Can we find context for our challenges and recognize that most of them are, much of them, very first world problems? That's not to minimize the pain and the challenge, but it is to say in context of where we find ourselves. And when I was uh, aware the other week, one of the things God showed me was a series of dials that were being recalibrated. And I saw all these dials that were my life, and they were being kind of moved ever so slightly, some of them a bit more than others, but they were all being kind of moved. And I said, Lord, what? what's going on? He said, well, there's some things that need adjusting and tweaking, son. They were not wrong, but they will not get you into the new season. They were right for that season, but for this new, new season, we need to change a few things and recalibrate. A few things have got to come into line in order to get into new season. And one of the things that struck me was so often when God says that we've got to change something, we sometimes assume that that's because we've done it wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean you've done it wrong. It just means it's not right for now. There's a big difference between thinking God's going, well, you've got to do this now. It may well have been entirely right. I felt like these dials were entirely right for that season, but for this coming season, they had to shift a little bit if I wanted to fully enter into it. And in terms of community and family, then getting that right balance, getting that dial right between being utterly honest and real, but where we also acknowledge the incredible goodness of God and his presence and work in our lives is, for me, key. I wonder where you were at on this dial. Do you have a healthy balance of sharing the painful reality of life as well as the ability to share what God has done and is doing? It's this thing we've been talking about of carrying two opposing things at the same time. Are we able to be able to share what life's like but also share what, what the goodness is and carry those two things together? And some of us... Some of us kind of, I guess, are a bit more this way. We're really good at saying what God's done and saying what's happening and declaring and successes, but maybe we've got a little bit to learn about just sharing the reality of how we feel about those things. Maybe some of us are too far this end of the spectrum where we've got to bring a little bit more of the goodness of God into our speech. But I think there's something key about finding that balance, at vocalizing our gratitude as well as being real, about our reality. But before we... But let, me, let me go now and think about this idea of what does Paul mean when he says weaknesses? Because this was intriguing to me. The word translated weakness in the ANV is the Greek word asthenia, I think, uh, which means a few things. But among them, it means this. It means want of strength, weakness, or infirmity. Or want of strength and capacity required to understand to do things great and glorious, to bear trials and troubles. 
So when Paul's talking about weakness, he's talking about a lack of strength, a lack, a, 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 this sense of infirmity, or he's talking about a lack of strength and capacity. Capacity to understand, capacity to do great things, capacity to bear up under trials and troubles. He's not talking about a lack of gifting or abilities. He's not talking about things that he doesn't have. He's talking about something internal and strength and capacity. This is about capacity and strength and the emotional, spiritual, mental and physical energy we have or don't have to keep going. Which makes much more sense in the light of the more well-known part of the verse, my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect in weakness. When Paul talks about boasting in weakness, he is talking about all the times we feel we don't have the energy, we don't have the capacity, we don't have the grace, we don't have the re those times when the reserves have gone down again. That's what he means. Because he knows that those times when we feel we don't have enough, that's when he comes in best. And it was interesting, Jesus agrees with him. There's a story in Mark's gospel we've often used to talk about finance, but as ever with Jesus, he operates on so many levels. There's a time when Jesus is set opposite the treasury and he's watching how much money people put in. And we read that many were rich put in much. And then it says a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. And then we read these words. So he called his disciples to himself. He said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had her whole livelihood. It seems that Jesus is impressed by her giving out of her relative poverty. But as I pondered these words, I came to see that perhaps this principle is not just about money and financial resources. Whenever we give out of our poverty, out of our lack, whatever that may be, our lack of energy, our lack of time, our lack of emotion, then we are walking the way of Jesus. And Jesus loves it when we give, even though we may not have very much to give. When we're low on energy, when we're low on grace, and we feel like we've got nothing left to give and we choose to go again. We are like that little widow who comes up and puts her two small pieces of silver. And Jesus goes, that is impressive. Because she gave out of her poverty. When as a parent you've already been up to your little one eight times after putting them to bed. And it's still the early hours and you go again. That is you giving your two small mites. When you choose again to try and build a relationship with that person who's rebuffed you so many times and out of your poverty you choose to operate out of kindness again, Jesus is there commending us. When we forgive again for what feels like the millionth time, even though we feel like we have nothing left to forgive with and we are so tired of going around the mountain again and again, Jesus says, look at this person who has given out of their poverty. I'm reminded of the words of Peter in Acts 3. When a beggar asks him for money, he says, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. What I do have, I give you. Peter was not upset. Peter did not make excuses because he didn't have any silver or gold. He just went, look, I don't have any of that, but I've got something I can give you. And whatever I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you. Now, maybe you felt ashamed that he had no money, or maybe you felt delighted that he had the gift of uh, healing to give him but the key point is this I don't have this but what I do I forgive you what I do I forgive you and I can choose to beat myself up and so can you for not being able to give more or I can accept where I am and offer that it may be less than other people might like it may be less than I would like to have to give but like Peter I cannot offer what I do not have and neither can you you cannot offer what you do not have. Jesus does not expect you to offer what you do not have. There is zero expectation you should give out of what you do not have. After all, Paul writes this to the Corinthians. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. And again, we've often associated these words with money, but, but this is the giving of yourself. And the gift is acceptable according to the willingness not according to what one does not have. And I think a lot of the time, 
when we get run down or we're at the end of ourselves or, you know, if you're a school teacher, you just want it to finish now, don't you? It's like there's two weeks left and you're just getting to the end of it because you've been there and it's exhausting and you're ready for your break and all that. Or if all the, the scenarios we go through, you get to this point where you're just like, okay, I'm just kind of, I'm just getting there to this place. And often we kind of beat ourselves up because we go, well, I wish I could have more to give. Yeah, but if you don't, you don't. And that's all right. Because if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. And so many times I've had conversations with people who say, yeah, but I can't do this and I can't do that. Okay, what can you do? I don't have this to give. Okay, that's fine. Listen, you only have so much time, for instance. If that's filled with working and kids and running the home, there won't be much left time to give. Or what you feel is quality time. Indeed, it may feel like it's two small pennies. But those two small pennies, if you will give them, are precious to Jesus. Because the size of the gift to Jesus is not about the size of the gift, but the context of the gift and the willingness to give. And of course, we must learn to be wise with the little we do have. Whether that be money, our energy, our time, of course, as a wisdom. But when we've done that, we have to come to a place where we know that our offering, whatever it is, is sufficient. Because the issue is not the size of the gift, but the willingness to give what we have, however little we may feel there is. And I just want to encourage you this morning to not focus on your lack and what you don't have and what you can't offer. You are where you are and you have what you have. The question is not about what you've got. The question is, are you willing to give what you've got? Are you willing to offer what you do have? That's the only question that needs answering. The message translation of 2 Corinthians 12.9 says this, I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. I quit focusing on the handicap. 2 Corinthians 12.9 in the message. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. Maybe it's time to stop focusing on the handicap, stop focusing on the lack, start to appreciate the gift of Jesus. And maybe it's time to stop beating yourself up for what you cannot offer or cannot give and start appreciating the gift of Jesus. And maybe it's time to offer what feels like two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny and to hear the words of Jesus who says, Assuredly, I say to you, you have put in all. Because out of your poverty, you have put in all that you had. I say to you, you have put in more. Because out of your poverty, you have put in all you had. So this morning, I want to ease the burden of feeling like you have to give what you used to give, even though you're in a different place now. Because you've got what you've got, and you can give what you can give. And as you give what you've got, maybe it's even more valuable when it comes out of your poverty. Maybe it's even more valuable when it comes out of your poverty. Okay, I want, I want us to pray, but I want us to just have a little bit of time of worship afterwards as well. Do you want to... I've said many times recently, but one of the keys of the Christian faith is accepting that you're accepted. And I still maintain that it's probably one of the big keys of just accepting that you're accepted. But some of you just need to accept that you are where you are right now and know that he's with you in it and he loves you. That in your tiredness and your weakness and the capacity that you've got now that you would like to be bigger, that's okay. And you might not be able to give what you could give three months ago, six months ago. That's okay. Because it's not about the amount. It's about the willingness. So just, I mean, maybe, you can, maybe we can just sing together. But just as we sing, or these guys sing, maybe we could just see if the kids could be a little bit quieter in this time. That would be helpful. I know it's not easy, and you do a great job, but it might be helpful. Thank you.
So Father, we just come before you right now, Lord, as we are, Lord. We know we can't come any other way, Father. Although we often want to and try to. But we come as we are this morning, Lord. With the capacity that we've got. With the energy we've got. And we thank you, Lord. That when we give even out of our poverty, you are so delighted because it's about the willingness, not about the amount. And Father, as we sit now, Father, we just want to receive your affirmation over us, Father. We want to give you the weights, Lord, of feeling the things we've got to do, but knowing we can't, Father. Perhaps the pressures, Lord, that we feel comes from you in some way, shape, or form. Lord, we give it to you, Father. We just want to allow you to love on us, Father. And to meet us where we find ourselves. In Jesus' name.